guys. Well, I appreciate it. I pretty much, I'm sure I know most of you guys on here. For those of you I don't, I'm Brian Decker. I'm the CEO here of uh, Modern Lending. I've been in the mortgage industry now for about you know 17 years um, or so now. And so what I really spend the majority of my time truly doing is really kind of studying. I'm kind of a going to the point of almost kind of becoming a data scientist, for lack of a better word, as I truly believe. And as I've kind of matured in my career, I've been able to make some really, you know, life-changing, you know, investments in a way because I've been studying the actual numbers. And, and one of the things I'm trying to bring you guys, I do this about four times a year for you guys, is bring you guys some kind of real value. And so the first thing I'm, you know, really want to start over, I'll kind of give you a kind of a synopsis of everything I'm going to be going over. Kind of the first thing I'm going to be going over for you guys is I'm going to kind of paint you guys kind of a, a clear picture of kind of where we're at in the market, some really cool research tools that I easily can use and what you guys can use. I'll show you exactly where I'm to kind of basically really kind of educate your buyers on understanding, okay, where's inventory levels at? How much inventory is going to be coming on the market? What type of prices are we coming to be expecting? Um, what markets are really, really hot for your investors? Because I'm going to be kind of going over that truly, I know a lot of people have been um, kind of not really pushing investment properties on people, but I'll tell you guys right now from somebody that does own a lot of investment properties, the two most recent properties that I put up for rent, one of my properties here in Riverside and my second one in Texas, I had over 50 applicants for tenants within the first three days. Um, and the market rents on what people are getting, even properties here in SoCal that used to not cash flow are cash flowing like crazy. One of the investment properties I picked up in Riverside for about 400 about well, 405,000 I was going to do as a flip. Um, I actually completely renovated it and I'm deciding to keep it because stupid rent on the thing I'm getting is about $3,800 a month on a property in Riverside um, that's probably worth about 575,000 um, even after my renovation. So I'm going to kind of go over that with you guys. I'm also going to kind of let you know some basically really great ways on actual a real kind of two programs I want to highlight first actually down payment assistance program that actually doesn't suck for for once you know um, and then number two kind of how to use the down jumbo programs and then really kind of find into something I'm watching you guys a lot of you both on the buy side and the sell side the way you guys are waiving appraisal contingencies and loan contingencies on the buy side as you guys are writing it up you're really protecting your buyers on it because it's actually really removing those contingencies. But on the listing side, I'm going to kind of show you guys what you guys need to expect and actually have the buyer's agent send to you guys if you guys really want those waived um, because the way everybody's doing it just on the RP itself is incorrect. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started, um, you know, directly on these items right here. First thing I want to basically kind of really walk through you guys on something that is very, very underutilized. And one thing that I specifically really go to is this particular report that is done by Zillow. I know Zillow, our best friend, of course, you know, everybody loves Zillow on this call, you know, not, you know, but what I want to actually show you guys is a really cool way that everybody can utilize to really understand exactly what's going in the market. These month, these reports come out the middle of the month for the preceding month, every single month. And it gives a really, really, really great overview. And it really wanted to kind of start everything off. So as you guys obviously kind of know, um, in May was the first month for, I believe since May, middle of last year that we actually saw inventory tick up a little bit. We got about 4% overall in the United States um, over month over month appreciation. Home appreciation obviously broke new records, you know, depending on the markets you're looking at, you know, appreciation went up anywhere between about 9% and 21%, depending on the market you have. Um, obviously, as you guys can see right here, homes typically stayed on the market for just six days before selling last month. So six days on market across the United States. Um, and for sale inventory obviously rose about 3.9%. So this link right here on Zillow under Zillow research, you get to go in here and you right under here under the market report sections, click it and bring it down. And then what's really cool is you can then come down here and select every single major market in the area. This by far has been the best aggregator that I have found of any free data information site so you can figure out what's going on exactly. You know, and it gives you, and it highlights obviously some major markets, you know, just a year ago, you know, three of Alation's markets, it tells you which ones have the largest declines. And so what I'll go ahead and most of you guys on this call are in the Riverside County market. So this is the first thing, obviously, I really want to kind of paint what you guys can kind of see. So first thing, the most important thing, what this does is gives us our for sale inventory right here in the market. Let me wait for this to actually load real quick. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right here. Okay. Let's pull it down. Let's go to Riverside. You guys can see all those markets and we'll go through it. So here's Riverside, basically county information. Let's go ahead and load this up. Come on. 
I know because we're streaming. Okay, here we go. So tells you right now, as we can basically see, currently in the market in all of Riverside County, we have 10,780 houses that are for sale. Okay, to give you guys kind of an idea from a monthly absorption standpoint, we're looking at roughly about a three month supply of houses, three months supply, a healthy market, it's between six and seven months of supply. So we're still 50% short on that. We're going to see our supply from a year over year standpoint, we're still down 34% on our supply here in Riverside County. So one thing is very, very important to utilize is when you guys start seeing and you're worried about if these inventory numbers are ticking up, a really good metric on this specifically is to look at where these inventory numbers specifically lie by using this awesome algorithm uh, that Zillow has come up with on one of their free tools. The other thing you can see right here is Zillow's home value index. This is another one I always go and utilize. It's a really cool tool. You can go down there, pick every, any one of your major markets and really allows individuals to really kind of frame to see where and how we're comparing against other markets out there. So as you can see, Riverside, California, pulling this up, these are these numbers. Look at those freaking value. Riverside County is up 19% year over year. And I'm going to use this right here to kind of pause for you guys and really explain. So think about it this way. The first thing you guys need to make sure that you guys are painting, not just towards your first time home buyer clients, but also really going ahead and painting towards your guys' clients that are investors is this. When you have something like that is going on right now in the form of inflation, so I'm going to kind of use this as a whiteboard and kind of share this with you guys. So what we're going to basically kind of go ahead right now, and every one of you guys know inflation is the rising of prices in retrospect to a fiat currency in essence. So think about this. So we know right now that inflation, okay, is basically real inflation, they're saying is somewhere between five and 6% inflation, okay? That means basically every year, you have got to be earning 6% on your money just to not lose any buying power. So if you're putting in the stinking bank account and you're earning 2% interest per year, which is a great CD by, you're actually losing 4% of your wealth every single year. So why and how, People always talk about real estate being a hedge against inflation is, is this. I'm going to paint a very, very easy, clear example. So we're going to say that, you know, Michelle in my office is a prime example. She put $20,000 down on a house last year when I convinced her to buy it. Okay. She bought on that house that was 550000 bucks. So she used about a 3% down conventional loan when she did it. Okay. What'd she do? And this is how you want to explain things to your rent versus your buyer. Say, okay, you got 20000 bucks in your bank. You have two options at your scenarios that you're going to do it. Option one is you put 20% down or $20,000 down on a house. It's controlling a $550,000 asset. Now, last year in Riverside County, we saw a 19% appreciation across the board month over month. Now that's, now that's comparing May of last year to May of this year, which is when values kind of come down. So it's more about a 13% increase. So what ended up happening was, is Michelle took that $20,000 down and guess what? No matter what down payment somebody puts down, it has no effect on the value of the asset, right? If she would have paid cash for that house or she puts 3% down, the, how much that house goes up in value has absolutely no impact based on what the loan balance is. So in this case, you know, Michelle's house now, because we're doing a refinance, is appraising at $650,000. So Michelle took her $20,000 down payment and she used it to control an asset, okay, that is 97% more than her down payment on that lever, right? So she basically levered that up 30 times and her $20,000 down payment has now led her in one year to $100,000 in additional net worth through the equity of her house. Now, let's just be real. Michelle won't mind me saying this. There's no damn way in hell that Michelle is saving $100,000 in a year without using this. So now if Michelle did, did nothing, and she left that $20,000 in her bank account. To give you guys an idea, that $20,000 today does not have that same buying power as where it does last year. So guess what? That $650,000 house now, Michelle no longer even has enough money to put 3% down and cover her closing costs. Why? Because that value of that home has gone up. That 3% down just for the down payment is $20,000. Whereas up here, it was only $16,000. So her money that sat in her bank account lost more buying power than it did if she would have invested it in this property. So 
putting it very simply put in a very easy way, Michelle would have been better rather than keeping that money in her bank account to go out there and buy 20,000 cans of Coca-Cola last year. Okay. Why? Because let's say a can of Coke last year was $1. Okay. For one can of Coke. Right. And so at least last year, if she would have bought in 20,000 cans of Coca-Cola and put it in her garage and she would have sat there. Well, guess what? A can of Coca-Cola, and I actually literally looked this up, is now on an average of $1.10 for a can of Coke. So if Michelle, now a year later, would go out and try to buy Coke, she could no longer buy 20,000 cans of Coca-Cola. She can't because they went up $1.10. She can now only buy 18,000 cans of Coke, right? So now, obviously, Coca-Cola did not go up in value. A can of Coke did not appreciate. What happened was the devaluing of the dollar. So as a renter, if they are sitting on the sidelines with money in their bank, they better find a way to be earning a minimum of 6% inflation or 6% interest just so they're not losing their buying power. Now, they were wrong about it in 2018. They were wrong about it in 2019. They were wrong about it in 2020. The house prices were going to continue to fall. So when you're explaining something to an individual about how they how the rent versus buy scenario basically works, the way you first off need to explain it to an individual is very simply understanding the fact that when you go to buy a property, you are taking a certain amount of money and you are basically getting anywhere between a 20 to 30 time lever on your money because the amount of money that you're putting in is controlling an asset 20 to 30 times more valuable than the deposit you're paying on it, right? Now, the average homeowner or the average renter and the average homeowner, they save the same amount of money every single month. The difference between those two is the simple fact is a house becomes a forced savings account, okay? So... As I kind of go through this, I'm going to be kind of looping, uh, looping these numbers in. So we're kind of going in, and it's going to lead me to the next part. Now, the great thing about when you buy a home versus when you rent a home is guess what? Your mortgage payment doesn't change. So somebody, when they go buy a house, their mortgage payment, when Michelle Moore got her mortgage last year, her mortgage payment was $3,100 a month on her house with taxes and insurance. Guess what? Her mortgage payment right now is still $3,100 a month. Now, Going down here, and this is the scary part, okay? So this is really, really, really important, and I want you guys to utilize this. So if somebody is going out and they're looking and they're going to rent a property, look at this. Look how much rent has gone up year over year in Riverside County. 17% rent increase. 17% year over year rent increase. It went. From 13, you can see it coming all the way up back back in 2015. Average rent in Riverside County was 13.48. Average rent today is 22.13 in Riverside County. Okay, now you go ahead and you look in all pretty much every market out there. Atlanta, way up there. You go ahead, Houston, Texas, only five percent. Why did Houston, Texas, not have as much on the actual rent side? Because look at Houston, if you guys know anything about Texas, because I own a bunch of properties there, Texas appreciates at a completely different level than most of most individuals. So you get when you're going through and you're pulling up and you're looking at all these rents, most of them are going around 5% on those rents. You look down here and we start looking at stuff, San Diego, almost 9%. So in the nation across the entire board, the average rent that people were basically going up across the entire United States, let's, whoops, sorry, one here. It's 5.4%. So we're almost three times that amount. What does that mean? Is because when what happens is, is when you are going through and when somebody is buying a house, okay, what's going to happen is their actual mortgage payment, let's say your mortgage payment is a total of a total of 3100 bucks a month. Okay. And let's say that house that she could have rented was $2,800 a month for an example. Well, guess what? At even a rental rate increase of 6% per year, Okay, by year three, her mortgage payment on that number is over $3,200 a month, okay? So it's that short-term sacrifice for that long-term gain. And that's one thing that people need to understand. They need to understand how aggressive 
rentals, rents are going to be basically rising. Okay. So let me come back here. Let me go. I'm going to show back to my screen specifically here and I'm going to watch, walk you guys through. So by the way, first tool that you guys definitely need to be looking at right here is you really need to use the Zillow research. It is unbelievable the amount of stuff that you guys can be able to see and be able to do. It's looking ahead at house prices, home sales, gives you all these basic data on where our actual home sales are at, how much our year over year inventory is, and it gives you that market pulse the middle of every single month. And it is a really, really, really rad report to basically go ahead and do. Now, the next thing I wanna kind of walk into you guys is I wanna to continue to debunk the amount of actual delinquencies that are basically coming in. So. Another really good source, if you guys want to know, if you go to blackknight.com, when you go to blackknight.com, you click on the data reports, you come down here, and it gives you the press release. It comes out every single month, and it's an amazing, amazing thing to be able to do. So I want to kind of go over this for you guys right here. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on my screen so you guys can see this right here. Okay. There you guys go. Okay. So. To give you guys an idea, and I want you guys to basically break down the exact amount, because one of the big things that everyone keeps talking about very specifically is the amount of foreclosures and forbearances and all these things that are coming up. So first and most importantly for you guys, I 100% do believe that the, the actual uh, forbearance of a moratorium will be ending by this year. They will not be extending it. I think they'll probably go through September and they will not be going and extending it for that amount. So to give you guys an idea, foreclosure starts are down 25% year over year. So when everyone keeps saying, oh, these foreclosures, they're good, they're gaining and gaining and gaining. Yeah, foreclosures went up 2% month over month, but they're down 25% year over year, okay? So, and you're gonna see pre-sale inventory rate, this means short sales, down 26% year over year. You know, loans that are 30 or more days past delinquent, 39% year over year that it's going and gone ahead. Now, foreclosure starts, foreclosure sales that have gone as a percentage that are over 90 days old, they are up for foreclosure sales. But why? Because guess what? It takes a longer amount of time to actually have a foreclosure go into sale, right? When you foreclose on a property, it takes months and months and months and months and months before it hits the market. So obviously, we are up from an actual year over year perspective because foreclosures that were being sold last year, those are people that had were in trouble way before COVID days. However, month over month change, we're down another 12%. So here is where it's very, very important and what I want you guys to kind of see. So do not let people basically say that. So the number of properties that are 30, mores, 30 days or more past due or in foreclosure right now is 2.6 million, okay? So 2.6 million homes are 30, or 30 days past due. Okay, I've gone ahead and I've gone over it before. You're going to have less than 10% of all of these homes have less than 10% equity. So even if, let's say we are something crazy, it might be the very, very peak of the financial crisis. We saw roughly about 35% of houses that entered into pre-foreclosure hit the market. These are only 30 days past due. Okay, the number of 90 days or more past due, but not for, are we at 1.6 million. So let's say worst case, absolute worst case scenario, we say 25% of all of these hit the market. Okay, that is a grand total of 400,000 houses. Okay, 400,000 houses will hit the market as, po as a possible foreclosure. Well, we very well know we already need twice as many houses that are currently listed for sale right now. They're already, we're sitting right at about a million in inventory. So we really need about 2 million houses listed for sale. Okay, 400,000 isn't going to do, you know what, to the actual thing. So use this, use Black Knight, use these statistics, teach your individuals, whether that is renters, whether that is investors that are saying, oh, I'm waiting for all these foreclosures to go. What you really need to be showing them is what those rental rates are doing and the massive shortage we're going to have in renters, which I'm going to go over here. I mean, massive shortage we're going to have in rental homes for sale. Um, that's something I'm personally really dumping a lot of money into right now as well. Now, it also tells you, basically kind of breaks down on here. So you're going to see when you want to look at kind of how, what are the best states. So you can see these are the states that are the actual very, very, very best by actual default rate. I mean, you're looking at this by, you only have 2.5% of all the homes 
in Idaho that are currently in forbearance still at this. So go Idaho, go Colorado, go Utah, go Montana. All of those are doing very, very, very good. Here's your higher end states that are 95% more delinquent. Mississippi, Louisiana, Hawaii, Nevada, and Maryland. Those are your heavier states that are obviously having the higher percentage of those. And then here's your turnaround states down here. So as you can see, all of those states, I'm a big proponent on Florida. I'm a big proponent on Arizona, a big proponent on Idaho and Tennessee as well. Okay. So a great, another resource that you guys can basically go ahead and use. Now, the other thing I want to walk you guys through is basically here. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to basically start, and this is a really, really important piece of information. So here is something that we basically have is housing starts. Okay. So let me go ahead and I'm going to pull this up just move this bar. Okay, here we go. Okay, so, and this is something that we have is a big, 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 big issue. Okay, so you guys can see this. So what this is, is this is the number of housing units that have been basically started. It's right on Fred. If you guys don't use Fred, Fred is the St. Louis's Fed's data. It's free information. It's the very, very best information that you can get on data for basically trends in the market. It's literally just go to St. Louis Fed, click on data. Fred is the search engine you can use and you can type in anything you want. And I have a bunch of that stuff here for you. So what this shows is, look at this. We have always in the United States been building between about 1.2 and 1.6 million houses per year. And obviously we've gone as high as 2.4 million. We've always done that trend. Now, down in the early 90s, we had a little bit of a dip down here when we hit that recession, but we've always been building that. Look at this. And people wonder why we're having such a housing problem and a housing shortage. Look at this. Starting in 2009, okay, realistically, about, yeah, about 2009, and I've said before, we could not deliver houses. So we have this massive, massive, massive shortage. Once again, further shortage when COVID happens. So basically, we cannot build this out of this. So this is a great article on Bigger Pockets. If you guys do not subscribe to Bigger Pockets, it is a very, very, very good. So you guys can see right now, currently at the end of April, we have home sales. We're basically down 36%. Why? Because there was no freaking inventory. Because it is not that people aren't wanting to buy, is that we are down to only a 2.1 month supply of houses. We've gotten that up to about two and a half months, like a little over two months that I basically said. So we physically are not going to build our way out of this. Now, one of the things that you're going to basically, let's see, here we go. Okay, perfect. So why, before I go on to the, the last kind of component of this, before I really kind of dive, dive into some of the program stuff and some of the other things is this. One of the things that we need to understand, and for anybody out there that wants to grow their actual business, what you need to do as a first-time home buyer, yes, I know they're they're kind of a longer nurture sequence, but you have to remember move up buyers, buyers that are going to transition into something else, they typically a lot of times already have that real estate agent. So for new people that are trying to go into something, first time home buyers are going to make up about 41% of all purchases over the next five years. I mean, you got 4.8 million people turning 30 every single year for the next five years. And these individuals, their mortgage payment compared to their rent payments with the rising rents are going to be nearly identical. You only need to put three or three and a half percent down. There's even a cool new down payment assistance program I'll get out there. And I'll tell you right now, these kids have it. Basically, the only reason why most of them aren't buying a house, truthfully, right now, is they really just feel like they, they don't have a fighting chance because we're not getting enough inventory, you know, and that's truly where it's at. But one of the things you need to be explaining to your investor clients is this right here. Okay, so what this is, is not only are we having a major shortage of houses, but what the biggest problem that we have is, is a shortable of affording houses. What that basically means is individuals that cannot afford the median home price or longer are going to be being forced as continually to be a renter. And with a rent moratorium coming up, you're going to have somewhere between about four and six million renters that have not been able to come up. They're being forced at the end of September to pay rent that they're going to be forced out of their places that they've been living for basically for free. Now, will, will they all come out? No. But the problem is we're going to get a ton of these individuals coming out. And what we're going to basically see to kind of give you guys an idea, give you guys right now, back in the day, 34% in the 70s and 80s were all houses were built as affordable houses. 34% of homes completed were basically built as affordable housing. Okay, 34%. Now, look at this. This is the number of homes that are constructed or being built that are on the low end of housing. 
it pretty much fell off a cliff in the 2000s. What does this basically mean? Is we are going, and you can see right here, look at this. Look at the percentage of houses. We were building in the 80s, late 80s, and all the way through here. We were building, we got 40, 20, 30, 40%. And even through the early 2010s, we were basically building about 10 to 12%. We are under 5% now of all houses being built are affordable houses. What does this mean? These people are never going to really have a chance to buy. So what is that going to do? It's going to continue to force rents up. So what am I, why am I bringing that up is because what I want to do as somebody that is going to coach and bring up investors is by using the Riverside County rental rates that you can go ahead and you can use, like I said on right here, and you guys can go into these markets and you guys can play with wherever these rental indexes are in California. You can clearly show that buying a rental property here with the rental rates that are coming up here in Riverside County and you're talking about doing a 10 or 15% down on a rental property that is getting these types of rents, and you know that there's not going to be a housing supply shortage, investors buying investment properties or what they call the build to rent right now. So what most pension funds and hedge funds are doing is they're working with Lennar, they're working with these home builders to buy the houses before they ever hit the market for rent to buy. And we're going to have a very significant shortage. So when you are understanding or explaining to your investors that say house prices are going are too high, okay, you need to explain to them that we're not building any more affordable houses. So being able to gobble up some of these three twos and some of these lower end houses, the rental rates and the way they're going to be going up compared to locking that loan into a low 3% fixed rate is going to be some of the best investments. I have completely stopped flipping any houses that I'm doing. The two last two properties I had, even though I kind of went ahead and remodeled them for, you know, to flip them, I'm not selling either one of them. I'm putting renters in there because we're going to be short 3.8 million units into by, by 2020. And that was before COVID. 3.8 million houses are we short for these individuals to try to be able to move into. So we are going to have an insane, insane level of being able to have rental demand for these properties. Okay. So kind of going back to, you know, any questions on any of that stuff, Joe, before I kind of go into the next section? Yeah, I just messaged you uh, one okay. question we had from uh, Misty Cochran. Okay. What this is, is Bigger Pockets uses a really cool thing. And what they've done is they've matched where this comes into, which is basically income growth and population growth. And they put a list together. So what this list is in order of is the largest income growth combined with rent growth in the country. Now, obviously, when you look at these, you also want to come down and you want to go ahead. And when you do these, it gives you the median income, the new median income, what the rental income percentage is, and all of these items and puts this in. Now, what you can use this for and what I always use this for is, no, not all of these are prime rental candidates. Why? Because San Francisco is obviously the house price is so expensive, it doesn't make sense. Same with Seattle. But where, what are the hot markets that are right in here? You got anything that is in Florida. You got Miami, Orlando, Port Lucius, Cape Canaveral. You got Utah. You got Reading, Pennsylvania. You got Reno, Bloomington. I'm not a big fan of Portland, Oregon, personally, with all the nonsense that's gone over there. So I scratched that out of my list. You got Midland, Texas, Katy, Texas, bon Bonton Beach, Florida. I'm not, a, like I said, Oakland, not a big fan. I personally am not. I try to buy in states that are landlord-friendly states. Fort Myers, Denver, Colorado, and Charleston, South Carolina. Those markets right there have the largest income and rent growth perspectives out there. Now, outside of that, what I am personally a really big fan of is I use something called the Atlas Vans. So one thing that you guys can utilize that if you guys haven't actually looked at this, and I'll share this on my screen right now for you guys, or you guys can see that. Okay, so Atlas Vans. So if you type in Atlas Vans, and then you could, um, uh, let's see, Atlas Vans um, uh, report. Okay, so what's cool about Atlas Vans, and when you come in here, you can actually come in here and through their actual, they'll tell you based on their actual, let's see, I think it's the infographics. So here we go. So what you can actually go ahead and basically do is, is when you go on here, you can actually see the migration patterns of individuals that are basically going ahead and utilizing it. Let's see, this is the one from 2015, but you can go on there and basically do it. And what it shows is, is it shows 
where individuals are basically going and you can go it into a lower pattern. So why am I basically bringing this up? So let's see, you can do Atlas bands. Let's see migration, I think it's 2020 migration. There it goes. Okay, cool. And then here it goes. So what you can basically do, which is pretty cool, and it shows you basically where everybody's basically moving. You can come in and download that report, and it tells you based on how many individuals are moving to obviously those particular areas on the inbound. So what I personally do, anything that is a heavy blue inbound, that means 55% of total shipments were moving into the state versus out of the state. And as you guys can kind of see, let me zoom in here for you guys. What's cool is, is it gives you the actual breakdown of the actual number metrics on each and every single one of these ones. So just looking at this chart, what you're gonna basically use inbound versus total. Look at that, 1,349 out of 17, I'm assuming that's 1.3 million over 1.7, or maybe it's, you know, whatever, 13,000, I'll look at the number. Look at that percentage of inbound versus total. So Arizona, I'm a huge fan of. Texas, I'm a huge fan of. Tennessee, I'm a huge fan of. Virginia, I'm a huge fan of. Idaho, I'm a, you know, a huge fan of because it's cost. Utah, huge fan of. Nevada, huge fan of. So what I personally tell people to be able to utilize is show them through the migration patterns where more people are moving to those areas to specifically being able to go it. And then what I like to always utilize and teach people, of course, is basically using the rule of, you know, the rule of 1%. And what's a really kind of cool thing is on bigger pockets, if you come here on these reports, which I'm also, if you come in here, it gives you all the breakdowns of everything on these. Um, and when you come into bigger pockets, they have a whole tool and a lot of their analytics that I'm a big, 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 big fan of is if you come in here and you go into the actual education forum on it. And when you come down here, what it'll basically do is they'll give you all the actual, they'll do something called the 1%. Um, thing and it'll list all the properties on bigger pockets. I can send it to you guys and download it. All the properties that have a 0.75% or 1% rental rate. What that basically means for all of you guys is, is this is when you guys look at going ahead and you factoring in, what they basically say is when you have a 1% rent ratio, what that means is to give you an idea, like in Katy, Texas, if you buy a $250,000 house and it has a 0.75% rent factor, what that basically means is the rent, basically in this case, which would be about $2,000, is at least 0.75% of what that total purchase price is. So your the 1% rule really doesn't exist too much. I look at a 0.75% rule with also combining it with low property taxes. So my personal favorites right now is anywhere in the Boise surrounding anywhere, anywhere in like kind of the Mesa, you know, Arizona, Phoenix surrounding area. I really, really like the, the greater Nashville surrounding area and the greater, um, uh, Memphis surrounding area. I really, really like Katy, Texas and San Antonio, Texas. Um, those are some of my absolute favorites personally. And then I really like the Orlando area and the Fort Myers area of Florida. Um, so these are all the areas myself personally, where I either own a rental property or I'm currently searching in those rental properties because they have the highest rental ratio. And what a client needs to be able to do, they need to understand about taking cash out of their property and actually using that because that equity is just sitting there. So most people, what they can end up doing is pulling that cash out of the property. And let's say their mortgage payment was $2,000 a month and their new mortgage payment is $2,400 a month. That $400 a month increase based on if you're going ahead and you're getting a property that and you're putting 20 or 25% down on that property. And most of these states, you're going to cash flow between about 250 and $350 a month. So that, uh, that higher mortgage payment is 100% completely offset there. Not to mention all the depreciation of that rental property is a further tax deduction. So it's really going to result in a, in a net zero. And then two, guess what? Somebody else pays off your mortgage payment for you. And then, you know, in 20 years, however you set it up, now you have a free cash flowing property. Most of you guys probably from the buyer's agent side, when you guys submit an offer and you write waive contingencies for your appraisal, right? You'll mark the no on your RPA card form, right? Or if it's loan, you'll put no loan contingency. And now buyer's agents, the good news for you, and the reason why this came about is we had a reloc relocation company that is a very, very, very large, the large relocation company in the country. And when our buyer went ahead and the agent actually wrote up the offer to the listing agent, 
and the listing agent accepted the offer and the buyer didn't realize actually that their appraisal contingency was waived. They just, when the agent sent it over to them, they you know just filled it out. The buyer didn't even realize that. And he put an offer in like $75,000 over what it was listed for. And this was like a $550,000 house. So the buyer was just kind of upset about it. Um, but the relocation company attorney well, that was looking at the, the actual RPA said, well, it doesn't really matter. I said, because legally based on car, that if the actual contingency release form is not completed and submitted like with the offer. So you guys know when you guys, you know, sign off your contingency that if you don't actually submit the form waiving the appraisal or waiving the loan and submit it on the contingency release form when you submit it with the offer, by law, you can still back out over that appraisal or loan contingency that the contingency is not considered removed based on that form. It was this long, lengthy negotiation because the, the buyer on their side is a super anal engineer. And so the relocation company attorney got involved and said, this doesn't really matter because if it's not done on this form, we actually called to verify this over at CAR and they said, absolutely, indeed. Why am I bringing this up? Because buyer's agents, for those of you on the call, when you guys waive your appraisal contingency and you don't do it on the separate contingency form, doesn't really mean anything. They're not, if, if it ever went to that thing, the buyer can still back out for the appraisal because it was not done on the appraisal, the actual contingency release form. Now, listing agents, if you want to hold those buyers and those buyers agents, you know, feet to the fire, you need to make sure that they submit that contingency release form with the offer on the separate contingency release form. So even myself who's been in this industry for 17 years. I mean, I had always kind of wondered why that form wasn't being get done, but I'm not a realtor, even though I have my license, I don't do that. So I wanted to make it a very, very really important point for all of you guys on here. And I even got all of the information from the directly from the attorney that reviewed it. Let me pull this up for you guys. So, and I can right here, let's pull this up. So I had Nathan in my office, write this up. So I, I'll send this out to you guys for basically the difference between passive and active contingency removal being the exact car form. No form has been submitted. The contingencies are still in place if it is not on a separate, your separate contingency form. So I'll send this out to you guys, but I thought it was very, very, very important, um, obviously for you guys know. So for listing agents, anybody you are actually getting those offers, it, you know, accepting those offers, based on the fact that you are assuming those contingencies are released. Let me just tell you, if they are not on the separate condition release forms, those contingencies are still in place per car. So that was something kind of cool to be able to utilize on that. Um, any questions on that? Does that make sense? We do have a question from Peter. Um, if you have an investment property now, can you do a cash out refi to use that money to purchase more out of state properties? Yes, 100%. You can, on, a, on an investment property, you can do a cash out refinance all the way up to 75% of the value of the property. You can use new value of a property after six months um, on that property. Um, so let's say you bought a property at 300,000, now it's worth 400,000. You can do a cash out refinance up to 75% of that, that, uh, you know, that dollar amount, use that cash out and buy out of state properties. Um, and I personally went and got licensed in every state that I am buying properties in. Just so one, I could do all my own loans. And then two, obviously we can do, I can do all my own purchases there as well if I need to. And so I basically, we went and got licensed in Tennessee, Florida, Arizona, uh, California. We've obviously been Nevada, Utah, Texas, Idaho. There's eight total, six are live now. And with Utah and Nevada coming on board, no later than the end of next month. Everything's approved. We're just waiting for them to get caught back up for COVID. Um, and so, and then the last one we're going after as well is North Carolina um, for that um, specifically, just because I went in everywhere that I knew had great inflows for migration patterns, um, as well as um, obviously very, very pro landlord friendly states. 
Um, and that's the big thing about, especially all these agents that are on this thing. Like that is the difference truthfully between a really good agent is somebody that actually has a network of investors or individuals they work with. The problem is why most don't is because they're not confident in educating themselves and they feel like if they get an investor on the phone that they won't necessarily know what to do. And so by utilizing some of these tools like Zillow or Bigger Pockets or these tools and the Atlas Vans migration line patterns, you can really start to educate yourself on that. And mind you, you know, if you're working with an investor here and you want to refer them out to buying a house in Tennessee, sweet, make your real referral commission, you know, and get it and build a, build a great relationship with an agent out there that sends you stuff out here. And mind you, don't get me wrong. Like there are some still great investment properties here in California. I mean, the desert area, I mean, you can get some great stuff out there, whether you want to do some short-term rental stuff on it or even just longer-term rental stuff out there as well. Like Rams Hill and Borrego Springs is one of the best short-term rental markets in the country. So Rams Hills is private golf community out there in Borrego Springs area. I have a couple of buddies that own properties out there. They bought for like 400 to 500,000. And but they're consistently doing between about six and $7,000 a month in revenue on those properties. Um, that's a, you know, which is a great, 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 great one out there. And mind you too, out here, you know, if you're staying and low tech, the key is, is HOAs and high taxes is what screws you on your rental income to working out. But if you can get properties like that are in the lower tax areas of kind of the of Menifee, you know, that have been built kind of you know prior to 2004, where it's like a one two tax rate, low to no HOAs, stuff pans out. I mean, you're talking about a four two that probably will run you, you know, call it. 460, you're probably talking, you're going to be able to get probably pretty close right now to about $2,700 a month in rent. That mortgage payment with 20% down, you know, with everything all in on it, you're probably looking is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 22 to 2,300 bucks a month. So you're going to cash for 400 bucks a month on a property that's going to appreciate about seven to 8% per year, not to mention the rental rates continuing to go up. So, um, and then the, I saw something about senior rentals. I think senior rentals are great. The problem is, is most people can't buy them in 55 and over. Um, there's very few communities out there that you can do that. Um, you know, so if you can buy in a 55 and over community, cause you know, it allows you to be able to do that. That's a great, great resource to be able to do it. Um, the other thing that's another really, really good way of being able to do it is if you can buy and you can actually get a property and buy it as your second home and convert it to a rental property because then you can do it with just 10% down. Now, the rule for that is, is you have to be able to be at least 75 miles from your current primary residence. And it's got to be in a destination that can be considered a second home destination. So what a lot of people do to get into their first property is, you know, is they can, they'll put just 10% down as a second home. They'll claim it as a second home and then they'll eventually convert it to a rental property. Um, that way it allows them to get into the market with one at a lower interest rate and two at a lower down payment. Now, this isn't something that you can obviously do. And if you live in Temecula and buy it in Menifee, no, but this is 100% something you could do and buy it in Havasu or, you know, buy it in Scottsdale or buy it, you know, in Eagle, Idaho or buy it outside of Nashville. Um, and those are some really, really solid ones to be able to do. Now, the other thing I kind of really wanted to basically kind of go over with you guys specifically is I'm going to show you guys right on here. So one of the big changes I wanted to make you guys really, really aware of was a massive, massive change. I put it up yesterday, a massive change with FHA. So one of the big things for everybody on this thing, if you guys want to put some content out there right now, FHA did their, the greatest thing that FHA has ever done for the 40 million people that have student loans. So the way it was with FHA is the most commonly used first time home buyer program or just home buyer program out there, right? Three and a half percent down all the way up to 477,000 Riverside County or 822 in LA County or 822 in Orange County. They now used to, if somebody had, let's say $50,000 in student loans, they hit them with a $500 a month payment, even if they were in an income-based repayment plan paying 50 bucks a month, or even if they were deferred or any of those items. And that crushed people's buying power that had student loans. Beginning August 16th, the FHA will use one of two things. One, the payment that's being reported on credit, okay, as long as it's above zero, or if it's zero or in deferment, only a half a percent. So they now mirror exactly what conventional loans do. This is huge because most individuals that have fifty to $100,000 in student loans, they make usually good money. But what was ended up happening was is their student loan payments that we're using to hit them crushed them. Now, 
If they're in an income-based repayment plan, which most are, so somebody owes $50,000 in student loans is probably only paying hundred bucks a month. So instead of hitting them with a $500 a month payment, now we can only use hundred dollars a month. That gave that person $80,000 more in buying power, $80,000 more in buying power. So that is super important to be able to kind of put some you know, good content out to everybody and all your buyers, because I'll tell you what, if you really, really, really want to grow your business, best thing that you could ever honestly do is start using content as king. So one of the things that I went ahead and made a valiant, very important part about 18 months ago to change was to go out and really put a ton of content out there. And I'm talking a lot of content. I came up with a content calendar. And what I basically did is I hired a guy. I mean, I brought in-house video. I brought all that. But for starting out, what you can do is you want to go on and you can literally go on Fiverr and hire yourself somebody that is a very simple graphic artist that will create you your own content. And what you, if you committed to literally just doing, I guarantee you guys, picking a medium, and I would suggest Instagram or either TikTok, picking up Instagram, making three simple reels a week, okay? For all of you guys know, reels is basically like Instagram's version of TikTok. It's super freaking easy to do. You go onto reels, you pick a green screen out, meaning you could take a picture of any image that you want. And keeping current matters is a great reel and a resource for constant information out there. Take the screenshot of it. You put it up as your background green screen and you make a quick 30 second video, okay? You look up through using hashtag IG um, and it'll give you the 20 most commonly used hashtags. Do a reels and start doing them three times a week, 15 or 30 seconds. And I'm talking dumb stuff, guys. I'm talking not complex stuff. People will eat it up. Literally simply is how to buy a duplex, you know, how to buy a duplex, with an FHA loan. Hey, did you know that you could use just three and a half percent down and buy yourself a duplex? Then you can rent out one and have your mortgage payment be mostly covered by the other one. If you didn't know that or looking for a duplex, reach out to me or, you know, hey, if you have student loans, as you know, FHA just made it a ton easier to qualify or, hey, are you renting here in Riverside County? Rental rates have gone up 19% in the last 12 months. Stop renting, get yourself into a home, happily can send you, you know, houses under 300,000 and make that consistent pattern. You do the reels and what you do is you get somebody on Fiverr and you reach out to them. And what I do is every week on Sunday night, I send my guy about seven or eight articles that I like and or different videos or news sources. I send them to him and he creates them into carousels for me or, or infographic images. And then basically what I do is he gives me those infographic images and then I go in and I put them up every single week. I used to get no business off Instagram at all in any way, shape or form. And now like the Instagram and TikTok of loans that are coming in the door is now accounting for about 15% of the loans I'm closing. And I'm only 18 months in. Now it is not the easy shortcut. It is a long game, but content is king and evergreen content is king. And if you truly want to expand your business, rather than sitting there and constantly buying these random lead sources, which don't get me wrong, that's fine, but you'll spend a hundred bucks on these leads you don't know, or you're, you're farming, all those things are great. But let me just tell you something. Right now, the biggest group of individuals that are going to be buying homes for the next five years are the individuals that are currently between the ages of 26 and 36 years old. They consume what they want through YouTube, through Instagram, and through TikTok. They do not consume it on Facebook. So for everybody putting stuff on Facebook, I think it's great to reach out for some investor clients or that, you know, that move up buyer. But if you want to go after individuals, you need to be doing that. And a great book to read is called Content is King. It's by um, Joe Paluzzi. He's amazing. You can just look it up on Instagram. Um, or Killer Content Marketing is another book he did. I pay somewhere around about $11 a day to have my, my infographics done. And then I personally do all my own posting and all my content writing myself because you just can't, you can't outsource that. If you outsource it, it's going to be garbage content because you know what you want to put out there for yourself and really go after it. And it really true, really will go after your business and pick a niche. You know, if you want to be the person that's going to focus in on, you know, reaching out for senior housing, then make a ton of content on that. If you want to be the person that wants to reach out, help nurses get into houses to put out content on that. But it's a huge, huge thing. I hate down payment assistance programs. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. And I've always hated them because of really these three reasons. First reason of down payment assistance is it had, the problem is they had income limits. 
you had to get secondary approval. Okay, secondary approval from either GSFA, Cal HFA. Basically, the world was you did the whole loan as a loan officer. When it's all done, you got to send it to a government agency to review it for two to three weeks after you're done. Make sure they agree with everything that you did and that your approval, and then they issue approval. So it would take you forever to close those loans, 45 days, which makes it impossible. The other thing is, is they had to stay in the home for a certain time. And then two, um, for the certain time. And then lastly, what you ended up having to basically do is on those programs is the rates were outrageous. I'm, I don't even want to try to spell outrageous. I'm a terrible speller. Um, rates were outrageous. And so it ended up and it capped people because of the income and where they had to buy. So realistically, you know, I've said it before, Cal HFA for the amount of first time home buyers approved like one to 2% of people that were out there. So this is what I like to call, I call it the NADA program um, is what I've called it. Why? Because it's 100% financing FHA. It's available in all 48 continental states. We offer it in all the states that we obviously lend in. What basically it is, very, very simply put, is there's no income limits. You can have a 620 credit score. You can be a first-time home buyer or a not first-time home buyer. It is basically... Oops, it basically can be as for primary residents and it goes up to the FHA loan limit. So that means an 822 loan amount in LA or in LA OC County, 753 in SD, and then 477 in Riverside, San Bernardino, and all those other areas. Now, how it works is very simply put it's a normal 30 day escrow, normal FHA loan. Everything is the exact same as speed. Every, no, no difference than if it was a normal FHA loan. The difference is they get a, they get their normal first mortgage, which is 96.5% mortgage for the first with FHA. This rate is about 0.75% higher than if they were just getting a normal FHA loan. But rates are like, you know, the 3.375 to 3.75% 30-year fixed rate. People are not balking at it. It's a great rate considering they're doing 100% finance. Then they get a second mortgage for the three and a half percent second mortgage. This interest rate right here, give you guys an idea. Home equity lines of credit right now are usually somewhere between five and a half and six percent. So it's six percent and it's fixed. So it's just a normal second mortgage fixed rate loan. So they get a hundred percent financing. So basically at the end of the day, they can buy a house up to about $490,000 and get a hundred percent financing on that loan. Then what happens is, is roughly about, call it a year down the road when their equity goes up, they can consolidate their first and second mortgage into a new FHA loan, or they can move it into a conventional loan and get rid of that second mortgage and go down to one payment. It is nothing funny or crazy about it. You're basically just a normal everyday 30 year fixed FHA loan. The only difference is, is instead of them coming up with their three and a half percent, they get it in the form of a second mortgage at 6%. So that mortgage payment on, call it 6%, mortgage payment is probably between about 120 bucks a month. So not only then for closing costs, obviously, if the buyer has their, you know, six or seven grand saved up, you know, then they can use that for obviously closing costs. They could get gift funds from closing costs as far as that goes. But the big thing is, is it bridges that gap to get somebody into the home. Now, it's a great way when you look at it and you look at Michelle in my office's scenario, if she had not bought her house a year ago, right, she would not be sitting on $100,000 of equity right now, right? Now, an individual that couldn't have bought a home last year because they didn't have the down payment, even if their monthly payment is caught 200 bucks a month higher than if they save up their down payment, the great point is, is okay, look, one year ago today, house prices were... Riverside County were, we'll call it 13% lower. So on a $400,000 house, they were roughly in the ballpark range, about $50,000 less. Now, would you rather pay $200 more per month, knowing that in a year from now, you're going to have, call it safely say, $30,000 extra in equity in your house? Or do you want to wait and pay $30,000 more for that house when and pay 200 bucks potentially less per month if interest rates come down? Because if you made 30 grand, $200 a month higher in a payment over 12 months is 2,400 bucks. Everybody in the, their mind would put $2,400 investment if they knew they could turn it into 30 grand a year. Now, obviously, you can't guarantee appreciation rates, but we well know that you're going to have 19,000 new 
single-family creations that want to buy a home and can buy a home here just in Riverside County, I can do it for any market you guys want, and we're only having 6,000 new homes coming to market because remember, a move-up buyer or an exchange does not create any inventory. If I sell my house in Temecula and I buy a house in Marietta, I'm not increasing the supply of houses. I'm giving one and I'm taking one, right? The only way we get new houses on the market is one, people sell here and they move out of state, which I've already gone over. Riverside County's population is going up, not going down. Same with San Diego's. So the only way we're really going to get new housing is with new construction coming. We only have planned now about 6,100 houses being delivered in Riverside County this year. And we have 19,000 new first time home buyers that will buy a home because we have about a 61% home ownership rate just in this market. So that's three buyers for every single new house coming onto the market. And that's just the first time home buyer segment. So we have a crazy way to go. Rental rates are going to be going up. And the last program I want to kind of, you know, hit you guys with as well is it's very, very cool. It's our jumbo program. I've been crushing it for some of you guys on here. I know a bunch of you guys on this loan. I mean, we just did one for, I know, Abdul Sayed. I don't know if he's on here or not. I mean, we got his off. We had docs out on that, that escrow in 12 days on a jumbo loan on a 10% down $1.7 million with an appraisal on it. So, I mean, on these, on this jumbo program, I'm not telling you it's 10% down, no PMI up to a $2 million loan amount. And we're close them in 21 days or less. I mean, they are fire rates and good luck trying to get your buyer with a jumbo loan approved with Wells Fargo or Bank of America. I mean, they're 60 days on there. Now they could probably get a quarter percent lower interest rate probably if they have a million dollars in the bank and they're going through Chase, but they're not going to do them any good because they can't get a house. I mean, we're literally being, and rates are good on the program. That one with 10%, 10% down, no PMI was 3%, 3.3% on a 30 year fix with no PMI and a 10% down jumbo loan. So, I mean, the rates are fire on that program. We're able to do like a 10-day loan contingency, 12-day appraisal on them, um, you know, and we're getting them out fast. So, for your jumbo clients on that, I'm telling you, that 10% down jumbo program is just ridiculous and it's good on second homes. So, that's the other really cool part is it's good on second homes, 15% down, no PMI on second homes up to 2 million too. Um, so, and it's, we do it in obviously all the states we're licensed. Um, so kind of a, that's kind of everything I kind of had wrapped up for you guys. Um, I'll take a couple minutes to answer some questions. If there's any questions, Joe. Yeah, we have one question from Peter right there in the chat. Do you okay. want to? Yeah, let's see. Okay. Okay. If they have funds and are able to combine that with DPA to come up a five percent down or the small portion cover going yes so that three and a half percent down can be utilized for both closing costs and or down payment so if they have call it one percent one and a half percent of their own money plus closing us they can combine that to put more down the main thing is it is only for fha loans it is not a conventional loan program it is only for fha loans so as long as that fha loan on the first mortgage is not exceeding the fha loan limits you can use it all day long um, as far as that sub goes so and interest rates are, like I said, on that program, anywhere between call it excellent credit, like high twos to a 640 credit score, kind of high threes um, on that program. So, um, and like I said, it is not, they don't have to be in the home any particular amount of time because it's just basically rather than them coming up with their loan, they're basically getting the, their down payment as a loan from us at a 6% fixed interest rate on that forum. So it is a really cool program. Honestly, it's, even though there's other down payment assistance programs out there, I'm not even offering any of the other down payment assistance programs out there because just good luck trying to get a 60 day offer accepted or 45 day offer accepted right now. And so to my knowledge, I know that on this program getting set up in the entire country, there's about 25 wholesale lenders like, like us, not like, you know, that actually even have access to this program because we had to apply it on a platinum program. We had to agree that we're going to send them a certain amount of business every single month to get on the program. So I know locally here in this area, I'm the only one that's got it. So for a certainty, so it's a really, really cool program. All right, Brian. Well, as always, thanks so much. Uh, also, Christy over at Escrow 321 for helping organize and put this together and my partner, Amy, with the Glante Group. Brian, you always drop so much knowledge, knowledge on us and we really appreciate your time, man. Yeah, of course, guys. You know, my